Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, my name is Jeremy Balfour, uh, MSP, and I'm one of the co-conveners of the cross-party group on volunteering. And I want to welcome you to the 2023 uh, Festival of Politics. This year uh, celebrates the 19th year of providing inspiring, informing people of all ages from every walk of life to engage in three days of debate. We're delighted that you can today participate in Volunteers and the State panel event in partnership with Volunteer Scotland. And later I'll be inviting you to make questions and comments um, in a few moments' time. If you are one of these people that can do Twitter, then you can do hashtag Festival of Politics and put down nice comments about the event. I'm pleased uh, to be joined by uh, three guests, um, Alan Stevenson, Sarah Redmond and Alan Shelley. Um, Alan is CEO of Volunteer Scotland, uh, one of Scotland's national centres for volunteering. And last year, Alan led more than 100 sector stakeholders, including colleagues from Scottish Government, in the development and successful launch of a 10-year volunteering plan for Scotland. Uh, Sarah is the Chief, uh, Chief Officer of Development with Health and Social Care in Alliance Scotland. The Alliance. Her work involves working closely with uh, members and promoting the role of a third sector as a key innovator and partner in realising Scotland's national health and wellbeing outcomes. And finally, but not least, um, Alan uh, Sherry is the Chair of the Community Learning and Development Standards Council. He is now retired but he's had a long career working in Scottish colleges. Alan is also a member of Jobs and Business Glasgow, Views Youth Cafe in Glasgow, East End and White Ribbon, Scotland. So let's just have a quick uh, think about where we are. About 27% of Scotland's adult population regularly volunteer for an organi organisation or group, um, and they will help deliver often public services. During COVID-19 pandemic, there was a significant increase in people volunteering and the way that volunteers gave their time changed. Now, um, as we've come out of that, uh, we're in a, a cost of living crisis and placing significant strain on public services, on organisations who engage volunteers and volunteer themselves. Many public services, as I'm sure we're all aware, are experiencing staff shortages and public se sector workers in many sectors are seeking better pay. And in that climate, we want to explore the whole topic of volunteering. We're going to start with um, a couple of questions to the panel from myself, and then it'll be over to you to ask questions or to make a comment. So I thought it might be helpful to start with a, a question maybe to Alan Stevenson, if that's okay. And that is, what is the current role of volunteers in Scotland? Okay, um, thanks Jeremy. Um, so I mean, I think the first thing is to, to take a step back and think of the scale of volunteering as you've you know, touched on. 27% of the adult population is about 1.2 million people that volunteer. Um, but when you break that down a little bit further, and look at that group of volunteers, you actually find that they volunteer in many different areas in many different ways. Around about 21% of those volunteers volunteer in um, education, training and coaching to help people in terms of personal skills. 15% um, of, of that volunteering cohort um, volunteer in health, um, disability and wellbeing. Um, and you've also got large cohorts of volunteers who volunteer in things like um, you know, working with children out of schools, 17%, working with children um, in schools, 11%. So it's absolutely huge. So to sum up in a few words, what volunteering does in terms of public sector um, is very, very difficult because the, the range of roles are, are huge. But probably just to um, illustrate it with you know, a few examples, um, so, for example, um, Silver City Surfers in Aberdeen, um, a group that provide IT skills to over 55s, and they do that on a voluntary basis. Or you could look to um, Compassionate Inverclyde, who actually are a group of organisations who come together and think about the needs of their community, 
um, and offer things that where statutory services stop. You know, um, companionship for people at end of life, um, welcome boxes for people coming out of hospital, school kids filling in welcome cards every day, every week, um, that go into those boxes, um, or whether it's um, you know bereavement cafes or friendship hubs, or whether it's singing that brings the community together. These are things that volunteering does that you wouldn't expect public sector to do. And what does that mean? Well, you couldn't probably sum that up in numbers. You probably couldn't sum it up in words. You'd have to speak to those individuals that are impacted by that volunteering, and they'll tell you it makes the world a difference. Sheila, any kind of initial reflections? Um, I, I think one of the things that we are very aware of, so um, the Alliance's membership covers um, small volunteer based organisations, um, so, so some groups and organisations that are completely volunteer led, um, but also some of our you know, bigger um, charities and, and voluntary organisations who very much work with and, and um, support volunteer roles. Um, it often strikes me that volunteering itself, and, and it can be, I think some of the, the figures that Alan's described, you know, are quite um, formal volunteering roles. Also what we see are often quite informal, um, you know, voluntary activities that people participate in. So, so things such as um, more community involvement, things where it's perhaps a, a life experience that a person has had that they then want to um, you know, provide that information, that advice, what's worked for them, um, and share that that knowledge and, and experience with others through maybe more peer support mechanisms. Um, I think health and wellbeing generally is quite a big motivator for people um, to, to to want to get involved in volunteering. It's um, and, and my uh, reasoning for that is I think it's volunteering itself. You know. Um, Sharing your experiences, sharing your 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 time and your, um, you, you know your your contribution with others itself is a health generating activity. So I think there's a there's a really interesting, um, you know, well being contribution that volunteering makes. I think something that is 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 also quite apparent in in the figures at the moment is that more and more it's. Um, you know, it's 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 quite a diverse range of, of groups of people who are volunteering in society. I think some of the biggest numbers are people who are over sixty. Um, you know, people who are living with long term conditions tend to volunteer quite. A, 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 you know, some of the biggest numbers of hours of, of volunteering activity um, in a month. So. Um, Making sure that the, the the volunteering roles reflect society is something that we're seeing more of, um, but it's also something I think that um, you know we want to continue to do to, to do more of because um, you know those those opportunities to volunteer is, is also something that um, you know people gain a lot you know through the, for, for their own health and well-being out of those activities. Alan, I don't know if you've got anything. I think, and just to, to, to kind of build on what's been said already, um, in our sector, about 30% of adult volunteers supported community learning development. Um, and that's from the full spectrum, from youth work to adult learning to community capacity building. And that's key. And for our, in our community, in our work, predominantly volunteers fall into two categories. There's those who'd like to work with young people. Um, and either through the uniform services or through traditional youth work, as you would see it. People who support adult learning from adult literacy to silver surfers, as Alan's already mentioned. But the, part of the key element is also helping communities build capacity to take responsibility and participate in things like um, participatory budgeting, to enable them to be empowered to question people like us uh, about how we're making decisions and how we're spending public money. Um, and often it's difficult for us to differentiate what people do because it's a bit of a seamless thing. Because people who are involved in youth work become advocates for other things. But so that's key, I think, for us is to make sure that we enable people to participate across the piece and to recognise that the skills that they have make a difference. I also think in recent years one of the big differences has been that the range of volunteers bring more extensive skills that previously were provided by the state through professional workers. 
Um, some of that's to do with demography. Um, I can say this now because I'm over 65, <laughs> is that you know, people of my generation, pe some people retired earlier and didn't want to stop working, but they brought a range of skills that previously they would have been employed full time and couldn't do. Um, and there are others who have missed out on that opportunity because of the precarious nature of the economy over the last 15 to 20 years before the pan even without the pandemic. So I think that's a key part of it. But one of the things that strikes us in our sector is that though they're a valuable resource and bring huge amount of skills, volunteers still need professional workers to support them to ensure the high quality of the, the experience for us, for learners, because we see everyone as a learner, but for in other areas to ensure that services are delivered properly and appropriately. So there's that balance, I think, as we see it, about the need for volunteers to bring that richness of experience and that diversity of experience, but then the requirement they have professional support in order to deliver that effectively. I wonder if I can, Alan, just kind of push you a wee bit on that a bit further. One of the things that um, surveys are saying now is that volunteers often feel they have, there's no difference between them and someone who's been paid. Um, and that kind of differential has disappeared. Um, I suppose from your perspective, is that a good thing? Or should there always be a difference between a volunteer and a paid member of staff? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think it's, I think it's very unfair to ask people to do the tasks that professionally qualified staff should do. Um, you know, people volu I volunteer in other things, and I do it, but I don't expect to... I previously ran organisations, I don't expect to run the, the, the boards I'm on now. I don't expect to do that. I expect to support, but I expect someone else to do it. Um, I also think it's really difficult for volunteers. If I take our sector for a moment in education, if you look at the major reforms proposed by the Scottish Government, um, they'll have a considerable impact on community-based adult learning and youth work. So if I just give you some of them off the, that I've got written down today. So how many of you have read Professor Muir's Putting Learners at the Centre? The Scottish Government's response to that document, the subsequent Hayward report on qualifications, the post-school education research skills purposes and principles report, which was published in June, July this year, and the Withers report on skills. You know, I'm, it's a straw poll, but I guess if more than one of you have done it, I would probably fall over. Uh, all those reports will have a major impact on what we do in CLD. Um, even if you only focused on the, bit, uh, the wider attainment bit in the Hayward report. But everything else will have a, a huge impact on what we do. I think it's terribly unfair to expect someone who volunteers for five or six hours a week to sit down and read those documents, have an intelligent discussion with someone else about it, and then come to a considered conclusion about how that's going to help their practice to develop. That's why we need professional workers. It's their job to read that, to put it into a context, and then to support um, volunteers to deliver within that framework. And for me, that's, that's crucial. Yes, they should be empowered. Yes, they should be engaged. We shouldn't treat them as handmaids to anybody or hand persons or whatever. But they sh likely should expect professionally qualified people who are salaried to do the work that makes sure the, the system runs effectively as appropri and appropriately. And I think that the other thing volunteers need is someone who has a view of what's going on out with the area they volunteer in. Someone who can bring, in, in our sector we have the inspectorate, someone who can bring that evaluative process to what's going on. Often things can be going well on the surface and you get a very positive response from the groups that you're working with. But it's not necessarily best practice. Sometimes it's because they like you rather than what you're doing. Um, so the reality is we need someone who can evaluate the effectiveness of what we do, particularly when we're in the public sector, when we're spending public money, or in the voluntary sector when we're being funded by either the local government or the Scottish government to deliver. There has to be some quality check to be accountable for what we actually do. So yes, professional workers, no to replacing professional workers. Though I have to say in our sector that's becoming very difficult to do as to trace where the cuts 
volunteers have stepped in to replace professional workers. It's very difficult because the lack of information that the Scottish Government holds on the services that support community learning and development. Okay, I think we'll come back to that in a moment, if that's okay, but say, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that. I think, I, I think there, I, I completely agree with Alan that, um, you know, we do need to be uh, aware and attentive to the, the possibility of expecting more and more from voluntary roles and, you know, particularly in a time of, um, you know, budgetary restraints um, and constraints, you know, it's, it, it's very easy, um, I think, for particularly in, in the voluntary sector. And, and, you know, we see that very much from, from some of our members that at a time when they're facing budget cuts, they're facing, you know, higher costs for delivering the services and running, you know, running their organisations. Um, they're seeing higher demands on their services and their supports, but they don't feel able to reduce what they're doing. There is a real risk that we, we, we rely more on voluntary roles um, or for people to do more, um, but not get paid anymore for that. So I think that is something we do need to be um, you know, attentive to. Um, I think there's also some concerns when you look at, you know, I was, I was mentioning some of the positives around volunteering and, and you know, the, the, the more, um, you know, the, the inclusiveness of volunteering, more and more people from different groups in society are volunteering. But actually, when you look at, um, you know, the employment rate for some people in society, you know, there's, there's real inequalities there as well. So there's, you know, there's a huge disability employment gap and that's, you know, that's problematic. So I think there's something about making sure there are routes for people to get into paid roles. Um, you know, sometimes you know, I was referencing the amount of people that get into voluntary roles because of their own personal experiences and, and they share and they support others, um, you know, in, in their own recovery and their own health and well-being through a peer support role. Um, we probably need more routes into to paid roles for that. You know, it's something that people value really highly in terms of their own um, health and well-being. And, um, you know, if, if that's the kind of, of roles that we're um, wanting to, to see in society, then, then those also need to be paid for. People need to be, you know, remunerated appropriately for, for the, the, the work they're doing. Um, so I think there's something there about the nature of work. Um, you know, I think that... Um, you know, more and more of us are living with long-term conditions or we're providing, you know, unpaid caring roles as well for, for people, um, you know, that we love um, who are also living with long-term conditions. You know, work has to work for, um, you know, our circumstances, um, you know, in, in life. It's, you know, perhaps the, the kind of model of Monday to Friday, nine to five really doesn't work for, for as many people these days as, as, um, as it might have done in the past. So I think there's you know there's quite a there's quite a lot of changes i think that are going on and I, i'm not sure all of our systems are keeping up with that um so i think it is something i think there's um you know there, there's there's the potential that 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 you know some people are, are taking on more responsibilities and in, in, in a voluntary capacity um I also think, though, that fundamentally, you know, volunteering, you know, community involvement, these things are real, you know, these are real goods. You know, there's, there's lots of strong evidence that, you know, having a, a say over decisions which affect your lives, you know, having strong connections in, the, in your communities, these are, you know, uh, good indicators of well-being. It's something which helps to generate well-being. So, I think there's, um, you know, it's, it's not always a neat thing. We need to make sure that those opportunities are available to people, but that they're not, um, um, you know, uh, happening instead of paid roles. Uh, I'll come to you in a moment, Alan, but I wonder if I can just preach a wee bit on that, Sarah, because obviously, uh, you know, public services, whether it's education, health, social work, all these areas, we're seeing a squeeze and we're seeing sausages, you know, even today, just dealing with constituents who can't get the services because people aren't there to do it. Should volunteers not just step in and do it? I think the risk with that is... Um, 
whilst that can seem like a, a short term solution, I think in the long term, one of the one of the big you know challenges that we face you know across the UK, but you know acutely in Scotland is um, inequality, and um, you know that is one of the the main reasons why you know some people are dying earlier than they should be. Um, you know some people are living less years in good health. Um, it's because you know there is less equal access to income to. Um, you know, to, to wealth, to having you know access to the good, the, the 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 building blocks of health. So I think the risk is that um, we we need to be considerate about the 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 the, the, the potential long term consequences of that. Um, those people who can volunteer and do so because they have the the, the conditions in life that allow them to do that. But that's not that's not going to be everyone's circumstance. So I think there's there's some there's some reasons why we need to be cautious of that. Okay. Alan, you're pushing volunteers. Let's get rid of all teachers and get this volunteer teachers in. <laughs> I don't know if you know what I'm going to say here, but um, no, I, 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 it's complex, isn't it? I mean, we're starting to get into the nub of this. It's it's quite contextual, you know. Fun fun fact: if you have an incident at sea or on a mountain. It's volunteers that are going to come to your aid, but if you're on land or whatever, it's it's probably paid staff. So there's there is a context to some of this, and there's a history to some of this as well. So, you know, when I hear um, you know opinions from different sectors, subsectors, and so on, trying to understand the, the context of that is really important. But I think for us, we try and ensure as a as a national body that there is clear water. So I use the pun again, clear water between volunteering and and paid work. You know. Um, the acronym I'm going to draw in here is FUN. I think volunteering should always be FUN, but I'm going to use the F for free choice. Volunteering should always be a free choice, and that starts to feel quite different from, from paid work in a sense that you've got a contract. You don't have a contract as a volunteer. You should have a volunteer agreement. You should have, have some idea about what, what the role entails and what's set out and how you get support and so on. But you shouldn't have a contract. You shouldn't ever have an employment contract through volunteering. And I think that's the danger that you step in and you create employment contracts um, you know, um, by, by mistake almost, by, by well-meaning, but you, you step into that space. HMRC um, are quite clear on when you, when you create a contract around volunteering, and it's when you, 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 you reimburse more than what would be considered out-of-pocket expenses, i.e. travel, food, subsistence, maybe a bit of, if you are, if you are actually maybe um, have a disability, you might need um, ad adaption technologies, etc. So that can be considered part of a, an expense for your volunteering. But you move out of that and, and you start reimbursing more than that, you're actually creating a contract. Um, and HRMC will be saying to them what you're doing around living wage, what you're doing around taxation, etc. So there is something here about free choice, there's something here about volunteering always being uh, unpaid in that sense. Um, although we, we look at expenses. And I think there's something else about volunteering not being for profit. You know? So if we talk about volunteering in private sector organisations that have got a profit motive, you have to really be clear about what's a volunteering role um, and what's, what, what's, what's a paid role. Um, it shouldn't be part of service cuts as well, um, we believe, through our charter. And, and it certainly shouldn't be a substitute for paid roles. And that is where the real nub is, is when you've got volunteers who are doing something very, very similar to people who are paid. How does that make you feel? Either way, it doesn't feel too great as a volunteer. It certainly doesn't feel too great um, as, as a paid worker, looking at someone working alongside, doing the same things, but actually not getting paid. And just to give you an example of that, you know, during the, the pandemic, we were, and, and this happened down, down south, so it does vary. <laughs> If you leave, if you go out the border of Scotland, you'll find that the, you know, the, the way we, we think about this it can be quite different. Um, but we were talking about volunteers um, coming in and giving COVID jabs to help out. Um, but at the same time, we were also paying doctors and pharmacists and others to come along and do that. And our advice was no. And it wasn't that volunteers can't do it. It wasn't that they couldn't be trained up to do it. It was the fact that you're moving into that space of volunteering, butting up against paid roles. Um, so that's, that's our position. Volunteering should be fun in that acronym sense, and in the other sense as well. <laughs> Alan, yeah, can you? I say this point, I mean, 
I spent most of my career working in the East End and in Greater East Rise in Glasgow, the poorest communities in Scotland, still are the pure, poorest communities in Scotland. And from this role in the, the, the Standards Council is that for many people in deprived communities, volunteering is the first step to get their confidence, their self-confidence back and to gain skills that prepare them for employment or further study that might lead to sustainable employment. And if we reduce professional roles, they, they have no markers as to what could possibly be achieved. And the Scottish Government rightly focuses on what I'd like to call family poverty, because children themselves aren't poor, it's the families that are poor. As in deprived communities taking away professional roles in areas like community learning and development make it very difficult for families to escape grinding poverty. And we need to consider that when we're thinking about middle class people taking up roles because they have time to do it, where in other communities volunteering is a way of getting back to work, to having a work pattern, to working out what it's like to be in a team, to have a degree of responsibility, to put, feel comfortable within that context of responsibility. Because in the communities that I used to work in, very few people had sustainable jobs. And particularly men, very few men had sustainable jobs um, for any period of time. And that makes a fundamental difference. If you could look, if you look in the sector I work in and say, I could be a youth worker, I could be an adult educator, that Sally would make this difference to my family. And it comes to the other point I'd like to make is that part of our duty should be for all volunteers is to give them access to training courses that give them accreditation with qualifications that are portable so that if people do want to move to employment or so on, that they have it. It's not just here's our group certificate. Now that means more joined upness across how education and awarding bodies work together with the voluntary sector and volunteers. But Scotland's so small that's not impossible. And we have a really good system in the Scottish qualification framework, credit and qualification framework. We're now talking about micro-credentials. I'll not bore you to death what a micro-credential is, but you can have chunks of learning that are amount for 10 hours that you could accredit and people could build up. And again, those people who have few or no qualifications suddenly feel confident in learning and have something that's sustainable that they can take to an employer or an education institution and say, look, this is where I'm at. And it opens doors. And I think sometimes in the, the big debate, we forget that's key for lots of people, is uh, giving them steps to escape from the poverty that that get, is getting worse. And it's going to continue to get worse, presumably for the next you know, four to five years anyway, in terms of if you look at the economic outcome. So I think that there's that debate in there with what with both Sarah and Alan were saying about the importance of making sure that we give people a framework and make it fun for those who want it to be fun, but put something else in there for those people who think, well, I'll enjoy the fun, but I could do something else if I had a few more skills or a bit more support. Uh, Alan, can I then ask you, uh, just to develop it further then, is part of volunteering for some people a step towards going back into employment? And if that, if that is the case, how do we make that jump from, so let's, <clears throat> you know, I, I work in a charity shop, maybe doing X number of hours. How do I then make the jump? Or how do you think the, the sector should help people make that jump from doing those hours to then maybe becoming another role, maybe in the shop or somewhere else, but jumping from a charity or volunteering into employment, paid employment? How do I, think, we I, think that? I think it happens. Uh, I think that does happen. I think more can, ha more should happen around making that more equitable. Um, you know, thinking about EDI, equality, diversity, inclusion, and ensuring that those those barriers. I mean, when I said free choice, it isn't a free choice for everyone because you have barriers in the way. So actually, it's it's our job as a national centre to break down some of those barriers. But it, but quintessentially volunteering. One of the key benefits of volunteering is about the skills it provides, about the the the, the tacit, the explicit skills, um, and also those you know the confidence, everything else that you get from the social skills as well, the you know um, just going to something regular as well each week gets you into that habitus of of preparing you for work. I think what I'm saying is, volunteering shouldn't be exactly the same as a paid role, but it doesn't mean that a volunteering role can't give you all of those things. 
So it is about thinking about what is that volunteering role and thinking about what are the differences between that role and paid work, but also thinking what the real benefits from that role as well. A good way to get there, I think, is actually to involve staff and volunteers together in creating those roles because they, they really understand where those differences lie and where they really get those, those experiential um, benefits. Staff also benefit from volunteering and they benefit from it in a different way. And it does feel different from work as well, but they get all, all those other benefits as well that they might not get in their, 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 their job. So it's, I do think it needs to be seen as something quite distinct, quite different. But let's not think that it's just, you know, that cursory fun, throw it away. You don't get all these benefits, you get all of these benefits and more from volunteering. Let's ensure we have those benefits baked in. But I think we can avoid the trap of saying, here, let's create a role that looks exactly like a, a, a piece of paid work, you know? Yeah. Um, as a politician, I always have lots of questions, but I've been told I can't <laughs> ask all the questions. So I am now going to open it up. So if you can uh, put your hand up, um, then somebody will come with a microphone. And um, if you want to say your name, um, and then just ask your question or make a statement. So the lady in the orange jumper right at the front. Thank you. Is it turned on? Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Gail Halverson. Thank you for the talk. I'd like to try slightly change track. I'm one of the middle class um, volunteers who is not on the ladder to, to move up, but, but we still need help. Um, I'm an architect, and so the volunteering roles that I've taken have all, all been to do with buildings. Um, Ten years on Gorebridge Community Development Trust, getting a 2.5 million community centre established, now working um, for an organisation that I run, which is helping in rural Scotland, and we're now looking at providing how affordable housing. In each case, I'm, I've personally come across this, and I meet so many other people that are coming across the problem of not having the expertise, the backup, there not being a resource pool of knowledge in our area. And when I think of everything that we went, I've been through um, with contractors going bust, um, financial crisis, um, an arson attack on the building, all sorts of things, and we had to reinvent the wheel every time. Now, if there was a pool of, of resources, a central pool, if the Scottish Government could provide some sort of central body where we could go to to get advice, it would be a real help. I, I come across this again and again. Um, a development trust in rural Scotland trying to have been taking sort of 20 years to get five affordable houses built in their community. They just need that expertise of lawyers, architects, um, building surveyors. I'm talking about the building sector, sorry, but I'm sure this will apply to other sectors too. If there was a central body, it would be a real economy um, uh, for, for Scotland in the future because you would be all these organisations would not be repeating the same mistakes again and again. So it would definitely be um, an economy to, to invest in something like that, in my view. Um, so I'd just be interested in the panel's view on that. Alan Ness? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, so, it sounds like a great idea, and I could see where you bring in expertise into organisations that obviously don't have the funds, don't have the access to that expertise. But I think, again, it's just finding where the boundaries are of that and, and how, to make that, how to make that workable. Um, there are similar types of, um, say, organisations in, in place. I'm, I'm trying, I think it's Tech for Good, Scottish Tech, for Tech Army, I think it is, that they do something similar in a, in a technology space. They bring technology experts together, and those technology skills are available to organisations who wouldn't have the funds available to do that. So there probably is a blueprint for how you could do that for our professional services. Um, I'm not aware of anything else that's there at the moment that does that. And it sounds like you're not aware of that either, and that's why we're in. You, you've got that issue. Um, but I don't think it's a bad idea. I think it's just making sure that those boundaries are in place, that it's not exploited. You can imagine how that can be exploited, that organisations that can afford to do that are suddenly availing of that. But uh, that'd be, it'd be easy to put in the, the right checks and balances to ensure that doesn't happen. Yeah, no, I, I mean, my observation recently has been that, you know, I guess in Scotland we do lack 
um, some of that social research and, and development um, initiatives that allow um, you know good you know good learning good practice in, in one area to be identified and and you know that learning to be shared and and um, you know to help I guess other parts of Scotland not make those similar mistakes or to, to kind of uh, learn and, and um, improve quickly. You know, I think some of the, the, the challenges that, that are facing us have been challenges that have been facing us for decades. So um, there is a real need for us to, um, you know, to give real attention to some of the, the, the social issues that, you know, are impacting on society. And, and you know, the, the, the risk is if we don't do that, and I think what we're beginning to see now is that it is impacting on, um, it's impacting on our economy. You know, that we have um, more and more people who are, who are feeling as though um, you know, they, they can't be in work because of, you know, health reasons. Now, um, you know, that, that is very much because of the, the, the social circumstances that people um, are finding themselves in. So I, I think, um, you know, I, I think there is a need for us to have some, you know, infrastructure nationally. We've been talking about, you know, the, the need to do that within a, um, you know, a, a, a uh, climate transition space so thinking about some of that that we need within um, the green economy um, but we you know that that you know needs to happen in a way that also doesn't leave any parts of, of society behind so so I, I you know I think it, there is a, a real need for for something I know you're talking about that within the kind of you know um, built environment space but, but actually um, you, you know, from the point of view of a built environment that is inclusive, that allows all people to enjoy the environment that they're in. You know, there's an inclusion dimension to, to all of these issues. Um, so I think that is, um, you know, something that, that you know, would be, um, you know, would be really beneficial, um, you know, uh, nationally. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I tend to agree. I think one of the challenges about community empowerment and devolving powers is that there is no overall view or overall resource to the point that Alan was making. So in theory it's great, but in practice where is that central knowledge across say 32 local authorities in Scotland that says this, this idea was really great and it worked in these five communities because, but and these 10 communities didn't work for the following reasons. Therefore, the learning from this is that. And it kind of ties in with the specialist knowledge. And I was reflecting on the, um, within uh, Glasgow that um, Glasgow Life wanted to give all its community-based assets to, to local communities um, based on a very successful model in a more affluent part of the city where people had the skills, they had people who were architects, people who were surveyors, people who were accountants, people who ran businesses who could support it. But in other communities, there was that lack of that social capital and skill set. And people were going to be given buildings that weren't fit for purpose, because that was one of the reasons why they wanted to get rid of them, and didn't have an idea of how they could make them viable as well. And there was no one there to go to, to help. And I think what you're saying is really useful. But it's that notion of the balance between centralisation and, and devolution. Um, a former colleague used to, to remind me all the time is that uh, the Cultural Revolution followed letting a thousand flowers bloom, but there's somewhere in the middle where we can devolve and let people make local decisions, but give them the resources to make better local decisions on the basis of, learn, on the basis of what's happened elsewhere. So I do think there's value there, and the, perhaps that's the Scottish Government needs to think a wee bit more around what would that look like without being directive or, or taking control back to Edinburgh? So, yeah, there's value in that, I think. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the chap here in the front row with a green shirt. Yeah, th thanks very much. Um, just a couple of points, um, just about um, looking at the word fun and also about like what, what volunteers, about people volunteer in the first place. I think when you look at kind of unpaid carers, I think it's not fun. Uh, because the, the state is clearly not there with respite or, you know, benefits or extra support or adaptions to the house, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, um, yeah, with unpaid carers, is 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 a massive, massive. I think it's a massive barrier, and with 
with with with uh, deprivation areas it's 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 really it's really important to look at that my second point is a question really about be about being realistic um because of my understanding of like looking at the feedback from volunteers from the pandemic in the nhs is that there's lots of positive positive feedback but there's also a lot of uh, criticism about not not feeling supported not feeling um, not feeling valued, uh, not having a, a kind of firm role um, of not being, you know, all these, all these kind of um, constructive and other criticisms. And so it's really like we know we've got over 10 years, we've had 10 years of austerity, it's not going to change. So these jobs, are they going to come? They're not going to come in, in the short term. Uh, you know, because I support organisations in the third sector with with funding, and it's and um, the messages I'm getting is a lot more competitive, a lot more competitive for for all types of fun, uh, funding. Um, so just a question of like where we're we going and 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 being realistic of of like the actual. Because I agree with you that we need staff to support volunteers, but actually, you know, where will it come from um, if the state's not doing it? you know, where the job's going to come from. Um, I, I, I agree. Where, <laughs> where is it coming from? I think we're all in this, we're all in the same, the same boat to some extent, that we're looking at where's the funding, um, where's the acknowledgement that volunteers are important, where's the investment in appropriate volunteering programmes, and volunteer managers and their professional development, and all of those things that you need to ensure that in future, this this thing that we we kind of love and cherish actually, you know, does is one of those flowers that bloom and, and, and isn't dying on the vine, you know, and and I think that's you know that that is a question that as a society we're trying to we're trying to wrestle with at the moment. For organisations, it is more competitive. Absolutely, no doubt about it. The, the number one issue for for most third sector organisations, you know, past how do we find funding is. How do we get volunteers? How do we get people into our into our organisation to support our our services? And you've also got the pandemic issue of the volunteers that were there are now doing other things. They're they've got other pressures as well. So you've had lots of people leave volunteer programmes, and you've not had people come back in to fill those places. And it's it's a struggle to get people in. There's no doubt about it. I think the key thing here is. There needs to be a, a there needs to be a value put on volunteering at the right levels to say we need to invest in this thing. Um, the other thing I just want to pick up on is unpaid carers. Um, I think volunteering helps unpaid carers, and unpaid carers do an awful lot of volunteering, but I don't think unpaid carers are volunteers. And I think it comes back down to free choice. I don't think they have the free choice. I think it's you have to care for someone. It's not volunteering, and it's not. Diminishing in any way an unpaid carer, quite the opposite. It's actually giving an unpaid carer that identity to say, don't put them in the bucket of volunteers, see them as something, um, something different, actually. And you need support, you need to support unpaid carers. Um, but that's probably a different question for a, for a different time. But yeah, I mean, I think we're on the same, I don't have that, you know, what's, what's the future hold? But I think we're all in the same boat saying, invest in this, invest at an organisation level, invest at a national level. Because look at all the good it does across society. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Can I come in on that? Yeah, please. Um, no, I, th I think it's a. I think actually, uh, your, your your comments and questions um, highlight the, I guess the, the kind of the the, the grey areas, the, 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 the bits where, um, you know, there's it's not always it's not always, there's not always neat answers to, um, you know, what's the difference between a voluntary role and a and a paid role, and actually. Um, the, the value that we place on caring is, is a, I think, a really good example. But actually, both in paid work and in, in um, for, for people who are, uh, you know, unpaid carers, in that, um, you know, we, we don't place enough value on caring, and we don't place enough support for those people who, you know, caring is a is a massive part of what it means to be human. Um, but actually, for, for for many people, when we're in caring roles. Um, that leads to poverty. It leads to loss of work. It leads to loss of wealth. It's you know there's some really, really pro you know problematic um, uh, you know um, societal implications around that. So um, I, I think 
I, I would agree with Alan. I think there's there's something about not seeing it necessarily as a, as a as a volunteering role. I think there's, you know, there's something about I guess the roles that we've been reflecting on, and um, uh, you know, where there's you know it is you know it's a freely given uh, you know time and and experience and knowledge, um, but actually underlying that are some of the inequalities that exist that mean that that you know not all people you know some people can choose to volunteer um you know and, and give their time freely but actually for some people they don't have that option employment is not a route through which they can easily access because of the circumstances they're born in you know because of um maybe um, an impairment that they're living with or because they're caring for people so i think you know inequality harms our society and i think there's you know that's kind of almost the the um, you know, it's it's po possibly sometimes too too often an unspoken about aspect of, of what we're 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 seeing in society at the moment around um, you know the cost of living and um, uh, the lack of the lack of economic growth we're seeing. So so I think um, you know that 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 you know the issue that you're raising really around the value of caring is, is you know it's, it's a really big one. I think it's slightly you know it's 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 different but related. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, with regards to your point about where are these roles coming from, um, one of the things that, that we're hearing very clearly from our member organisations is just how um, how low confidence is amongst the, 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 the voluntary sector, the, the you know, um, the voluntary community sector that, you know, sometimes we refer to as the third sector. Um, you know, confidence is low because um, you know, there have not been uh, uplifts in people's pay, you know, over over this last period of, of you know, constant crisis around our economy. Um, you know, contracts are still being expected to be delivered despite the cost of living um, and despite the fact that, you know, staff are not getting paid anymore. Um, so we're seeing, you know, an expectation that, you know, contracts will still be delivered at the same rate over coming years as they have been in the past. So, you know, organisations are really facing pressures at the moment to continue doing that. And that is often where our voluntary roles are are hosted. It's often where those supportive roles are coming from. So I, I, I do suspect, um, you know, we're, we're going to be talking more and more about the impact that... Um, the, the cost of living is having on our voluntary sector over years. I think we're going to see some organisations folding um, and, and really struggling to survive. Um, and, and one of the things that, that we're hearing from members is it's not it, it, it's partly that they're they're not necessarily um, having a, a huge uptake in new volunteering roles, but they also don't have the capacity to support those roles anyway. So I think there is there is a, you know a bit of, of of a kind of coming crisis around that. Oh, um. sorry. The, uh, I thought the, the question actually got. I don't want to sound very philosophical today. I think is is. Your question, I think, really is around what kind of society do we actually want and what choices do we want to make within the context of that society and what are we willing to pay for that? So that's the bit for me that, that struck me from your question, that um, if we debate about what kind of Scotland do we want, what does that mean, what's the state prepared to fund, what's the state not prepared to fund and, where does, and where's the volunteering role in that space? But there's also the interesting bit about the demography of Scotland. I mean, you, you were talking about the health service and, and so on. It's an ageing workforce at all, virtually every level. Focus tends to be on the highest levels because you know, doctors get more stuff than anybody else. So there's, there's a space in there for people in their 30s and 40s, the right qualifications where there will be jobs because there is a commitment still to a national health service in Scotland. So as people of my wife's generation and her are leaving. They need to be replaced and there's not enough young people. People who've got care experience, as perhaps circumstances change, have got a whole raft of skills. How do we fast track them into professionally qualified roles? How do we have articulation and progression routes from community-based learning like that into more traditional, I hate that phrase, more traditional learning, so that people who are really good, who are empathetic, because one of the distressing th things I find is that everyone seems to assume that technology is going to be the answer. A robot will appear at your door and care for you. We know that empathy 
and people actually talking to other people identify more issues and can solve more problems rather than just simply ticking a box. Um, and I think that that's some of the debates we need to have about where do we need people to do things and where can the machines number crunch and do things intel intelligently. But we need to think about that. But we also need to discuss what kind of society we want. I mean, we're very good in Scotland to say, oh yeah, it's great. We, we think we want Scandinavian, want Scandinavian levels of welfare and support, but just don't ask us to pay for it. Um, and we need to have that kind of conversation. And then where does the volunteering role sit within that appropriately supported so that people have time to volunteer? Sometimes, it's, most times it should be fun, I understand for others it won't be. But everyone can have the opportunity to volunteer without worrying about if I skip this shift, I might lose my job. So there's, there's a bigger debate there, I think, in what you, the question you asked. I'm going to go right to the back with the gentleman. I, I'm going to just say to the panel, we are um, getting very close to the Scottish Parliament here with a question and a 20 minute answer. So if we can maybe just um, edit our answers slightly um, or um, so we can get a few more questions in, or I will cut you off. So, sir. Thank you. Um, this is really uh, directed at Alan Stevenson. Um, you said earlier, and I understand why you said it, that um, volunteering shouldn't be a substitute for paid work. Uh, but you also uh, gave the example at the beginning of, I imagine, the RNLI, which is, I think, 97% uh, frontline staff are volunteers. Um, that strikes me as an incredible uh, organisation and an incredibly successful service. Um, what's your argument to say that those should be paid workers? Or, or would you make that argument? Because I, I find it difficult um, to say that that you know, that, that isn't volunteering at its very best, if you like. And, and there's an obvious reason as well, which is um, if you were to replace that by full-time staff, they're sitting about doing nothing a lot of the time, whereas the volunteers have got pagers or whatever to, to alert them when they're actually needed. But that's my question anyway. It's a good question. Uh, it, it comes back to the... I'll keep this brief. It comes, back to the, it comes back to the complexity, I think. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be saying to RNLI, you know... <laughs> ditch that and get paid staff in. I wouldn't be doing that with the Mountain Rescue S Service either. Um, I think, I think we're, really what we're talking about the charter is where you've got paid roles in there already, and it's, and it's that jarring with volunteering and paid roles. Um, now, how that came into to being is another, is another question, and how you just come up with what is you know, an emergency service and think, conceptualise that as, as volunteering in its essence is, is incredible, actually, the way that has happened. Um, but it would be difficult to do that today, I think. It would be difficult to do that tomorrow in another area and just say, actually, we're just going to go at this just, just with volunteering, I think. Because um, I think there will already be, there'll be, a, there'll be a history of paid, paid staff in there already. There will be service cuts, there will be funding pressures and all the rest of it, and then you're in a difficult territory. So I think, to answer your question, no, I wouldn't. RNLI, you're, you're certainly safe in my book and you're, you do a great service, I think, as well. And I'm sure volunteering has got, got something to say about how you do that and, and, and the quality of service and all the rest of it and the dedication that's shown. Um, so I wouldn't be doing that. Um, but I'll just say, if, if, we were, if we're looking at a different context, I would be bringing the charter, our um, volunteer charter, into effect and saying, have a look at that first and look at, look at those principles in there, the 10 principles, and, and can you meet those 10 principles when you're thinking about your volunteering roles? That just, that's a, that chart has allowed us to, to get blue water between volunteering and, and paid work, and I think it makes sense for most people that, that, that look at it. But that I that set myself up for a fall there, didn't I bring in that example? But that example itself is almost like, um, it, yeah, it's, it's showing you something very, very different and showing you why the, why the context is very important when we look at this and look at different sectors and how they operate. I tend to agree. I think that there are certain parts that lend themselves more easily to volunteering and the range of specialist skills that need to be on call but are not there. But in the same way, I wouldn't necessarily want um, surgeons to be volunteering um, in, that, in that sense as well, because you want people who've got that kind of experience. We need to be subtle here. There isn't, we can't be monolithic. We have to be stratified and be responsive to what we're actually trying to do and what's the best means of delivering it. 
And sometimes I think it's very easy for us, and you know, at my organisation sometimes, because we prescribe qualifications that make you a, a registered worker. And sometimes we need to think more radically about that. And sometimes we can't because of legislation, and sometimes we can't because it upsets the interest groups that are in our organisation. So it's about thinking appropriately for the 21st century and thinking what life in the 21st century is going, going, going to be about. I mean, I was just, just reflecting that uh, the other day there that my phone has more computing power than sent men to the moon. Because if you watch Apollo 13, you bring them back using a slide rule. Before I retired, first, the first time in 2019, I was speaking to some engineering students and I talked about having a slide rule and how I hated it because I was terrible at it. And they all looked at me like I had three heads and just dropped down from Mars to tell them that the aliens had arrived because none of them knew what a slide rule was. But they could all do massive calculations on their phone. And sometimes I think we've got structures and systems and ideas that probably weren't even fit for the end of the 20th century, but are certainly nowhere ready for the 21st century and the nature of what the 20, 21st century is going to be like. And something I think we need to, to think around that piece, around the volunteering element as well. What, would, what will 21st century volunteers need to do? What will be the differences and the roles that we expect of them? And what will they benefit from, from that participation? And how will we recognise that? Other than sometimes lots of it's been how they feel about themselves. I think society has a role to acknowledge and, I was going to say reward, but I don't mean necessarily monetarily, but reward people for their contribution in a way that we currently don't do. So that's a bit in there about that as well, I think. Anyone to add to No. No? Excellent. Uh, yes, um, kind of halfway back on the wall, perhaps yellow and white jumper. Hi, thank you for a really interesting conversation so far. Um, I'm a researcher, I research uh, employability support for younger people. Um, and my question is about I think it's about volunteering in the context of the social security system that we have. Um, so I see in my research, I think I see volunteering sort of being a bit of a substitute for work experience um, and also for supported employment for people with additional support needs and disabilities. Now those both work experience and supported employment can be paid and volunteering of course is unpaid. Um, and so I, I think the question for me is, how do we strike a balance between the kind of benefits of volunteering that Alan, you talked about, about sort of confidence building and social skills, which are great, and they certainly help people move into work, I've seen that, but also not saying, well, actually, you have to volunteer to be able to get that experience, or that's your only option in the context of a very ungenerous benefit system. Um, so how do we strike that balance of encouraging volunteering while also acknowledging that this is a very difficult time to do anything unpaid for lots of people? Um, you can, and remember these things. It was much easier to get work placements for people from the most deprived communities and with disabilities when the economy was booming. Companies took their corporate responsibility further than they currently do. And as soon as you hit recession, they start to chop the things that they think are difficult to do and don't hit the bottom line. So there's, there's that, always that paradox during austerity. And, and that's why it's important that public sector organisations don't fall into that trap too. Because the, the bodies that we fund as taxpayers should be at the forefront of offering, offering opportunities, paid opportunities, to the, to the audiences that you're serving in the research. And I'm not sure that that happens because often that's the service that gets cut to because they go back to this is what we need to do. We need to deliver social work. We need to deliver um, education because it says that. And then the government ring fences money. And tell, so they, they chop the things that are not ring fenced. All governments do it. This is not a party political point. The old governments do it. Um, so we need to think, we, it's back to what is 21st, what, what, where is the, the line in the 21st century? 
who benefits from paid employment in the first instance, the point that Alan was making, that, that ability to, to go along, to turn, up for your, to turn up, even if it's for a short period of time for your work, being part of another team, having new experiences and developing skills, and for whom the first step to getting to that is you need to be a volunteer in a more sheltered existence before you're put into another one. But I do agree it's, it's a challenge and, and I don't see any way out of it at the moment, um, simply because of the, the current economic situation and the projected economic situation. Sure. Yeah, I, th I think you, um, you, you're highlighting, uh, you know, another really important aspect of, of, of what we're experiencing at the moment. And I think, you know, um, as, a, you know as a voluntary sector, um, you know, there have been some examples of quite, you know, um, you know, less than ideal practices around that, you know, unpaid internships and, 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 and such like. And, you know, the, the, you know, who can benefit from such things, you know, is, is, is very stratified in society. So, so I think, you know, the, it is really important. I think it comes back to, you know, Alan's point about, you know, a, a, a charter which helps to set out, you know, and we all need to kind of, I think as, as employers, you know, there's a real role for, for employment in, um, you know, Alan, your point about what kind of society do we want? I think, you know, what kind of economy do we want? I think, I think employers are at risk of, of, of having to kind of play catch up with the nature of, um, you, you know, the, the, the demographics we have um, in, in Scotland and, and making sure that work reflects people's lives. Um, I think, you know, we do need to make sure that there are opportunities for people to, you know, to gain experiences, but not um, uh, in a way that excludes some people. Um, I think there's, there's quite good evidence that, you know, one of the things that helps young people, um, you know, build resilience, you know, it's a good indicator of well-being is the, the, the informal networks that they have, that they often benefit um, through their, you know, the grown-ups in their lives, the adults in their lives, um, you know, and, and, and those are often the opportunities that people get to, to have work experience, to have, you know, work-based placements. Um, you know, that, that needs to be something that's available to, to all people. Um, so I, I think there, you know, there are some, some um, you know, there's, there's some, uh, there's some real opportunities with this as well, though. I think that's the thing, that there's real opportunities for us to be um, looking at these, um, you know, these grey areas, these subtle areas. You know, what, one of the things as an organisation that we've been uh, having conversations around is, you know, there's, there's a real understanding that the best policy, the best strategies are made by involving the people that um, th they affect. You involve people with those direct experiences and then you tend to get much better policy, much better, you know, um, services as, as a consequence. That type of involvement is often unpaid. And that type of involvement for people who are in receipt of out-of-work benefits um, has to be unpaid because of the nature of how our social security system is structured. Um, but that is that is an injustice there. There's some people who can, you know, who, who are there sitting around a table offering their expertise and getting paid for it, and others who are not. So, um, you know, there's there's been some work um, in Scotland, and, and actually Scottish government have also been involved in this about how can people be paid for the, the you know, the invaluable time that they're giving based on their own personal experiences and life experiences um, and, and which is a real good for society, at least much better policies, much better services. Um, so, so there are, I think there's, you know, th th that's another example I think of where, you know, it's not always a neat distinction. Um, but nonetheless, I still come back to the point that, you know, we, we, we do need to, to understand that, that um, you know, th there are some distinctions between volunteering and, and paid roles. Okay, I'm, I'm going to try to get two questions in. So uh, if we go across to, and my apologies, we're going to go across to the other side to Jennifer and Tiffany's hand up. Um, we've got um, just about four minutes left. So um, we'll take both questions together and each panel member will have a minute each to answer the questions. Thank you. Um, it was just touched on what you were speaking about there then. So is there anything that defines the difference between volunteering and working and how could someone who's essentially 
involved with an organisation, go to their employer or volunteer lead with that distinction and be able to say, actually, you should be paying me for this and this is a voluntary role. So just if you could point to any of those, that would be helpful. I remember chap, I think, at the very front. Did you have a question? So just kind of quickly going on top of Sarah's point, I've been involved in a lot of this kind of grey area, kind of almost like policy volunteering to an extent, you know, not getting paid for it. And what I'm curious about is that, you know, it's the thing here's volunteers in the state. Is the state kind of almost using people here to kind of, where they're not funding it, you know, and moving forward, you know, do we actually want people to get paid for this? Um, do we, because looking at it from my perspective, you know, but when you talk about the work the Scottish Government's doing, you know, I've been doing work with the Scottish Government on this for a year, and they've been telling me, oh, yeah, we're working on this, we're working on this, you know. And, you know, I found that personally very devaluing somebody who's, you know, not personally going to be affected by that, but I'm still giving up my time, you know, as I'm not in receipt of Social Security benefits, you know. I'm essentially giving up while I'm at a table with colleagues from, you know, the Alliance and other organisations who are there and getting paid for it and doing the same work. But anyway. OK, big questions, short answers. Uh, well, what we are down the line, um, Alan. Uh, probably you just mentioned it in the last words she said there, she was doing the same work. So I think looking at the paid role and looking at the volunteering role and breaking that down a little bit and saying, is it substantially the same? If it's the same, then I think you should be getting paid. Um, so that's pretty much, there's, there's something else there as well about just that, that um, habit of employers saying, holding out a bit of experience, a bit of something on your CV and saying that can be free now and you need to question where they're coming from in that one. It's not always a, a, social, a social good. But there's some nature I see about prospect to work as well. It's also forming a contract. Um, so although you're not getting paid at that point, if there's a prospect you will get employed reasonably down the line with that organisation, then that is actually an employment contract as well, according to HMRC. So look at, look at the roles. And if they look the same, they're the same. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, so... Um uh, in response to the first question, the HMRC do have some, some good um, uh, guidance on uh, you know, what constitutes a worker relationship. It's not, you know, there's a difference between um, an employee and a worker role, um, but, but there's some, some clear parameters around that. And that's coming to, to your other point about, you know, paying for um, involvement. I, I feel that everyone should enjoy a basic standard of income. I think everyone, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in some of the work around a universal basic income. I think people contribute to our society in so many ways. Sometimes that will look like a, a paid role and sometimes it will be the caring that we offer, the community, um, you know, the, the community involvement that we have, a whole range of things. I, I think we... we um, we devalue too much of what is good in our society. So I think I think there is something there. Um, should uh, should some of the the kind of um, that deliberative dem democratic kind of participation be paid for? Yes. Should it be paid roles? Maybe not always. I guess I think it probably is something that um, I don't have the conclusive answer on. But I think it is something we do need to have dialogue around because it's a it's an increasing. Uh, example of the ways people are volunteering. Sorry, I'm not... No, no, that's good. Um, Alan? <coughs> Nothing to add in response to the first question, but to the second question, I think there is an issue around unpaid internships and how it reinforces um, stratification, the point that you were making earlier, that only some people can do it because they've got the wherewithal or their parents have the wherewithal to allow them to do it. So I think there's a debate round about if it's an internship and it's a job to be done, um, people should be paid to do it, no matter what it is, to be fair. Um, so I think that's my, kind of my view on that one. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, one of the slightly frustrating things of being a, the chair of it is that you can't answer the questions, which I, I will not get into, because I think there's been some really interesting comments made here, particularly from a question from a lady uh, on my left in regard to how the social security system interacts with volunteering and all that. But anyway, that's for another day. Um, we are nearly done, I'm afraid, so I'm just going to start with Alan on my far left and just one minute, anything to summarise, take away comment, and then we'll just walk our way down the line. I think we have to value what volunteers do and the skills that they bring, and they enrich the experience, not only for the, the people they work with, but also the professional staff they work with, because it gives them another sense of, another take that's not groupthink. 
I think we should celebrate it, but we think we should differentiate between what's paid employment and what rightly falls in paid employment and what volunteering is. And I accept it's not possible at every turn, but I'm, I'm with the other Alan in this one, is that volunteers should be fun and you should get enjoyment and feel that you've made a difference from it. Yeah, OK. Um, I guess some of my th concluding thoughts from this are that um, society benefits from, um, you know, from the ways people are able to participate in society. Not all of that is, is, is through paid work, that there is a well-being dimension to um, you know, informal to formal voluntary activities. And, um, you know, and, and that's a good thing. And, and I think there's um, opportunity for us to make those, op those, those roles, those opportunities more inclusive, reflecting, uh, you know, our society. Um, I think there is also some really big societal questions we need to keep having dialogues about. You know, um, the 21st century is different. Our institutions, our, our systems need to reflect, you know, how they look now. Um, and so I do think that we do need to have serious ongoing, you know, dialogues um, together about what kind of society do we want? What are we willing to pay for? Um, and, and how do we uh, tackle some of the, some of those, um, you know, social injustices that, that, that you know, we, we can see? Um. Uh, I, I mean, I think we're in a period now of public service reform, so it's right that we should have these discussions, community wealth buildings out there, national care service, we're having conversations around that as well. We need to acknowledge the role of volunteers. Um, we need to be thinking about volunteering roles from a preventative point of view in terms of the societal impact and look at uh, these roles as being enhancing and complementary, not substitution for paid work. Um, and I think that that actually calls on policymakers and so on to have really meaningful conversations, really meaningful consultations with the communities out there in Scotland and to bring in that voice and bring in that lived experience. And that's where a lot of volunteering happens. We've got a lot to say. We've got a lot of the answers as well, but quite often we're not listened to. Um, that's it. Thank you uh, very much. Um, we are coming towards uh, the end of our time. Um, so on your behalf, can I thank um, our three uh, panellists, um, Alan, Alan and Sarah, for their contribution. <laughs> can I thank you all very much uh, for coming along um, this afternoon. I hope you, at least it has perhaps stimulated some thinking and uh, perhaps encouraged you to go and volunteer um, or get more involved in volunteering. If you want to find out more about some of the policy issues, then you can go to the Volunteer Charter webpage or Volunteer Scotland's website. It has a lot of information. Um, do have a look at those uh, and find out more. And then can I also encourage you to hang around um, the festival, as I said, last, today, tomorrow and uh, the day after. Um, so there are lots of other events you might want to go um, and look at. There's a, a bookstore next door. There's a cafe. Um, so coffee, food is available. So please do make the opportunity uh, to have this. But again, just to thank you all very much for coming this afternoon and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>